There's a discourse where the Buddha is teaching Rahula how to meditate. And before he teaches them breath meditation, he says, train your mind to be like the earth. When foul things are thrown on the earth, the earth isn't disgusted. When fragrant things are thrown on the earth, the earth doesn't get carried away. Then he goes on with the other elements. Fire. Fire burns trashy things, and it's not disgusted by them. And it burns fragrant things, and it's not delighted by them. Water washes away dirty things, and it washes away fragrant things, and it doesn't feel one way, one way or the other about them. Wind blows foul things around, and it blows fragrant things around, and it doesn't get disgusted by one or excited by the other. So having established this principle of equanimity, this principle of not getting, letting your mind get elated by good things or depressed by bad things. That's when the Buddha starts in with the teaching on breath meditation. But he doesn't teach Rahula to be apathetic about the breath, to say, well, whatever comes in is going to come in that way, just accept whatever breathing there is. Part of the instructions is to breathe in such a way that you are sensitive, that you experience pleasure, that you experience rapture. So equanimity doesn't mean apathy. What it means is putting your mind in a position where it's going to learn about cause and effect. But there are definite preferences here. You do want to learn how to breathe in a way that's comfortable. You do want to develop a rapture. You do want to develop pleasure, because these are things that are important in the practice. You need them to keep going. Without them, the practice gets dull and dry and apathetic, and it begins to burn out after a while. What the Buddha is training Rahula in is that state of mind that's able to see cause and effect. Because the problem often is when things go really well, you get excited and you drop it. Or when things go bad, you get disgusted and you drop it. And you don't learn in either way. The attitude the Buddha wants is that when things go well, you learn why are they going well. Instead of getting carried away with how wonderful it is, you ask yourself, well, wait a minute, what's, what's happening here? What caused this state? Sometimes the analysis, if you do it while it's happening, is going to destroy it, so you have to learn how to do it afterwards. Sometimes it doesn't. So the issue is get your mind in a state where it's willing to learn, where it's going to learn from cause and effect, so you can master the skill. So that's how equanimity functions. It doesn't mean that you just don't care about what happens. You care. But you also care to learn about cause and effect, what really does work in getting the mind to, to settle down, what really does work in getting the breath to be comfortable. You can't just go on the power of your wanting it to be this way or wanting it to be that way. You've got to learn what actually works, what doesn't work. You may have some ideas about what should work, but when you find out that they don't, okay, you drop them. You're not attached to them. There's that famous passage where the third Zen patriarch said that the great way is not difficult for those with no preferences. There's only one way you can make sense out of that, is that you don't have preferences about what's going to work. You admit what's work, you, what works, you admit what doesn't work. Even though there may be ways of meditating that you would like to see work, but if they don't work, you just put them aside. The things that you might have a preconceived dislike for, 
But if you find that it actually works to practice in a particular way, okay, you don't let your likes and dislikes get in the way. That makes the, the great way a lot easier. Just look at the Buddhist teachings on the Four Noble Truths. You treat the cause of stress differently from the path to the end of stress. It's not that you say, I don't care which happens, whether it's stress or not stress. You do care. You care so much that you're willing to really learn. But you may find that it requires that you do an analysis of the 32 parts of the body. And a lot of people don't like that, but it's really important. And you realize, okay, if I'm going to get over lust, I've really got to look into the body. Take it apart, section by section by section, in your mind. And do it again and again and again, however many times is required. You may decide that you would prefer a path which is really easy, just involves letting go, letting go, and not having to get attached to anything, not having to develop any skill. But when you find that that doesn't work, you put it aside. That whole preconceived notion, if it's, if it's a path that takes a lot of work, don't be afraid of it. The mind has lots of ways of looking for an easy way out. All that work that goes into concentration practice is just an attachment. You say, well, I'm going to be beyond that attachment. I'm going to skip, skip over that because I've already seen through it. You can't skip over it. You've got to go through the process. You might find all kinds of ways of avoiding the effort and the practice. Same. You might decide, well, I'm just not up to this. I'm not good enough for this. I'm not cut out for this. Learn to recognize that for what it is. It's the voice of laziness trying to find some way to get around the practice. As John Mahabhu once said, don't be afraid of the effort that's needed in the practice. Don't regard it as an executioner. It's not going to kill you. just may take more out of you than you may want. But think of the alternative. If you don't do it, you end up looking back on a life and saying, gee, I could have put more into it, but I didn't. That's not a good way to look back at your life. It's better to say, okay, I knew what needed to be done, and I did it. And whether I got all the way or not yet, well, if I haven't gotten the way all the way yet, I've got another lifetime coming up. I can work on it again. That's what it means to be the sort of person with no preferences. You put in the amount of work that's required. You put, you learn to develop the skills that are required. Whatever the path requires, you're up for it. And if you're not up for it, you find ways of making yourself up for it. And you're willing to put in all the meticulousness that it requires and all the time and all the energy. Learning to be very, very observant. And when you find something that works, okay, whether you like it or not, you master it. If you try to plan the path out beforehand, that's just your ignorance talking, your preferences talking. And you've been following your ignorance and following your preferences for how many lifetimes? And sometimes they get you to good places, but a lot of times they don't. So it's time to put them aside. Learn to develop that mind that's like earth. Learn to develop the mind that's like fire. Not in the sense of burning you up, but that's willing to burn anything. Does its duty. Think of the meditation as your duty. You're here in this body. This body is causing suffering for a lot of other beings. Because in order to keep it alive, you've got to feed it, you've got to clothe it, you've got to provide it shelter. Look at all the work that goes into providing shelter. We've been seeing these huts building now for two years. OK, 
escape, got this body that, in order to stay alive, is depending on the suffering of other pe people, other beings. And if, when you put this body aside, you're going to get another one, and it's going to be the same process over and over again. There is, however, a way out of that process, which yields the highest happiness for you and doesn't impose anything on anybody else. So think of that as a duty. And whatever is required, you do it without letting your preferences get in the way. But there are those duties. Look at the Four Noble Truths. Each of them has a duty. They're different. And you definitely do want to work towards the end of suffering. You do prefer that. That's a legitimate preference. The question is, what's required to get there? Okay, you do whatever is needed to be done. Even when you've completed the task. Look at the Buddha. He spent 45 years establishing the, the teaching, the Dharma and the Vinaya. It took a lot of work. It wasn't with an apathetic attitude of, well, I don't care whether it works or not. He put a lot of effort into making it a teaching that would last. He said he noticed that some people would take the teaching and use it to good purpose. He said well, he didn't let himself get elated about that. There were people who listened but then didn't really put it to any good use. He said he learned not to get depressed about that. He had established mindfulness in such a way that he did what needed to be done. And of course he preferred to do a good job of teaching. But as for the results that came, how other people took the teaching, that was where he developed the mind that was like earth, fire, wind, water. He did his best, but as for how other people would take what he did, he learned how to put that aside. So apathy has no place in the teaching. There are preferences. You do want to put an end to suffering. <laughs> and that preference is so important that you're willing to put all your other preferences aside. <laughs> 